Okay, good morning. I still can't get over this uh, sound, sound system that we have. We used to have to shout, now we have to whisper. Uh, I'm Joe Antos with the American Enterprise Institute. I want to welcome everyone here and everyone online uh, to our uh, annual uh, conference on the Medicare Trustees Report. Uh, uh, my colleague, Bob Helms, who couldn't be here today, uh, was digging through his files uh, recently, and we found some slides from 20 years ago from uh, um, uh, the chief actuary twice removed. Uh, uh, of course, those slides were on uh, transparencies. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the general shapes of the graphs looked awfully familiar to me. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I want to... Uh, Thank especially uh, Paul Spitalnik, the Chief Actuary of uh, Medicare and Medicaid, for uh, joining us today. And uh, also, uh, if there are any, any of your colleagues uh, in the audience, I, uh, I want uh, everyone to recognize that uh, uh, the huge amount of work that goes into uh, the trustees report every year uh, and uh, uh, um, extend on behalf of uh, everyone uh, our thanks uh, for for that fine work. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Hit hit it and see what happens. Let's see if we have a slide. Okay, so this <clears throat> this is a slide that uh, that uh, I found in uh, a uh, Congressional Research Service report which I think illustrates the difficulty of making projections. It illustrates the uncertainty that uh, the actuaries uh, face uh, every year when they're making uh, long-term projections of, uh, in this case, this is uh, insolvency of the uh, health insurance um, uh, trust fund, the um, hospital insurance trust fund. Um, the, uh, oh. That's interesting. Okay, it isn't quite what I expected to see, but that's okay. The, the uh, latest um, report, this year's report, which came out yesterday, um, said that uh, the uh, HI trust fund uh, would be extended uh, to 2030 before the trust fund uh, became um, uh, insolvent uh, in the sense that uh, the asset level would drop to zero that doesn't mean that uh, hospital services could no longer be paid for after 19, after 2030. Uh, it means that uh, it would be, uh, HI would be on a, and essentially on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, and so not all of the costs that are projected uh, after 2030 could, could be covered by um, payroll taxes and other, other forms of revenue. Um, the... Uh, we have 16 years. This graph shows the number of years for each year that the trustees projected a, an insolvency date for HI. This, this shows the number of years that each report uh, uh, said uh, HI had left in it. This year, it's 16 more years. Uh, uh, 2030 is the insolvency year. Uh, but you can see that it bounces around quite a bit. And what that really says is that uh, the complexity of trying to estimate uh, uh, several economic variables at once, first of all, state of the economy, second of all, uh, the uh, uh, use of uh, healthcare services, third of all, uh, technology, the growth of uh, new and uh, creative and, poten and potentially more expensive ways to treat diseases. Uh, all of those factors and a whole bunch of other factors go into making these projections. And so when you read uh, Sarah Cliff, for example, who used to be with the Washington Post, said, uh, you know, good news, uh, the, uh, the trust fund isn't going bust. Well, you know, maybe or maybe not. I think, the, in fact, the, the trustees uh, pretty much uh, have, it, have it right, which is, uh, yes, We've had a few years of slower growth of healthcare spending, including Medicare. We don't know uh, really what 
explains that. We, we can all think of reasons why there might have been a slowdown, including slowdown in the economy. Uh, but we don't have a good, clear explanation, and we certainly have a li very little basis for assuming that things are going to just be great forever. Um, so, so when the uh, actuaries put together uh, the analysis for the trustees, they're, they're basically uh, challenged to uh, think not just uh, what happened in the last few years, that in itself is, is not always easy to uh, judge, but also what does that experience, what does that recent experience and longer term experience mean for the, for the long term? That's a very difficult thing to do. Um, one innovation uh, that uh, came out in this year's report, which I know others will comment on, I just wanted to say something about it, um, which is that uh, this year the trustees said, well, you know, we've noticed that for the last uh, 11 or 12 years, Congress uh, has not in fact um, followed through on the sustainable growth rate, which has called for double-digit double digit reductions in uh, the payment rates for physician services in Medicare. Uh, the trustees said, well, it's pretty reasonable to think that probably Congress will never take double-digit uh, cuts out of, the, out of physician uh, payment rates. Uh, that seems reasonable to me. What that says is, to me, is that uh, this year's projections are uh, perhaps uh, from that policy standpoint a little, perhaps a little more realistic, at least with regard to that one assumption. Um, and that is in contrast to uh, the CBO's approach, which I think is, is quite interesting. CBO decided, actually for the first time ever, that uh, that in their long-term projections that came out about three weeks ago, uh, that uh, they, they assumed current law for uh, the very large uh, and continuing reductions in payments to uh, uh, hospitals and other Part A providers. Uh, they basically assumed that current law would persist uh, for 75 years. In contrast, uh, Paul Spitalnik uh, pointed out, I hope I didn't lose it, here it is. Paul Spitalnik pointed out that uh, that may be an unreasonable assumption. Uh, and indeed, uh, a direct quote, the ability of healthcare providers to sustain these price reductions in uh, these uh, price reductions to uh, uh, hospitals and other Part A providers uh, that these price reductions will be challenging as the best available evidence indicates that most providers cannot improve their productivity to this degree for a prolonged period given the labor-intensive nature of these services. And then the next sentence I think is particularly important. Absent an unprecedented change in healthcare delivery systems and payment mechanisms, the prices paid by Medicare for health services will fall increasingly short of the costs of providing these services. This is a pretty clear statement to me that what we're doing now, we can't continue to do in terms of the way healthcare is provided, uh, not just in the Medicare program, but uh, more generally in, in the health economy. Uh, so um, perhaps we'll have some discussion about that. Um, let, me, uh, let me introduce the panel. Uh, I, I kind of partially introduced uh, uh, our, our main speaker, Paul Spitalnik, uh, but let me say a, a little few more words about Paul. He's the chief actuary for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, he's been uh, a chief actuary for a little over a year, a little over a year. Uh, uh, but he's uh, been with CMS uh, uh, for about uh, uh, 11 or 12 years and uh, has long experience in uh, actuarial uh, analysis. Um, I'm going to introduce people in the order that they're going to speak. Uh, Paul Ginsberg is the Norman Topping Chair in Medicine and Public Policy at the University of Southern California. Uh, and uh, he is associated with the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and, Econ and Economics. Um, uh, Paul um, was the founding executive director of what is now called the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. So he may have some ideas about uh, physician payment. Uh, and 
mo most recently, uh, he founded and uh, ran the Center for Studying Health System Change. Uh, next, Keith Fontenot. Keith Fontenot is a visiting scholar at the Engel Engelberg, Engelberg Center at uh, Brookings Institution and a managing director at Hooper, Lundy, and Bookman. Uh, Keith, uh, Keith is an old budget guy. Uh, I think I met Keith in OMB. I think to myself as a veteran budget guy. <laughs> well, old veteran, you know, it's minor semantics. Uh, although that makes me a veteran budget guy, so I'll go. I'll go with that. I, I met I met Keith in probably 1983. Yeah, yeah, in OMB, and uh, somehow our paths keep crossing. Um, uh, but uh, Keith uh, has had a, a long career, uh, pr uh, mostly at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, but he also spent some time at the Congressional Budget Office. And then finally, Doug holtz uh, Doug is the president of the American Action Forum. Uh, he, uh, uh, prior to that, uh, he was uh, director of the Congressional Budget Office, uh, and prior to that, uh, he was uh, associated with a vast number of organizations, including Syracuse University, right? Yes. Syracuse University. We don't have that in here. Uh, I mentioned that because I'm from Syracuse. Um, anyway, so with that, uh, Paul, uh, take it away. All right, good morning, everybody. And I'll, I'll just start by um, responding to the, uh, the, the graph that uh, Joe put up here. Um, respect to, uh, with respect to the projected number of years of HI insolvency. And you know, Joe might look at this and see that there's a, a lot of variation, and you might infer that um, you know, the actuarial estimates of these things tends to vary a lot. Um, and, and if you just look at the pattern that has presented itself over the last, say, 15 or 20 years, um, you see that there was a low um, in the number of trust uh, uh, years for HI insolvency in 1997, and then there was a pretty rapid um, increase thereafter, and there was some pretty significant legislation that was enacted um, during that time period. And, and then it stabilized pretty consistently, and then you see in 2003 to 2004, there was a pretty precipitous drop. And another common theme there is that there was a pretty significant piece of legislation passed in, in, in that time period. Um, and then stayed pretty stable, and then from 2009 to 2010, there was another pretty sizable change in the number of years for HI insolvency. So I look at this chart and see things a little bit differently. I see that the largest influence on the number of years for HI insolvency isn't necessarily the underlying health care cost trends. Um, those have been pretty consistent throughout, and they might change nominally year from year or even you know five year, 10 year periods to, to the next. The, the biggest change um, is with respect to what the program looks like and what the policies are in place and what the underlying legislation is. So I'll start that as the introduction, give you something to react to. So, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the financial status of, the, uh, of uh, Medicare. Uh, the trustees released their annual report yesterday and we'll talk a little bit about um, the new developments that were uh, announced in that report. Uh, we'll start with just taking a a current snapshot of where the program is and how we how the program got here. Um, and then we'll evaluate the uh, different views of Medicare financial status. There's different lenses that these can be looked at. Um, the first is what the trustees report on, um, and that's the formal status of the trust funds. Um, another way to look at uh, Medicare expenditures is by making some comparisons relative to other healthcare expenditures or how Medicare fits into the larger um, federal budget. And so this is just the current snapshot. This you know, do, doesn't change all that much, except perhaps the number of enrollees and the number of, um, and, and the various uh, you know, revenue numbers. Uh, but in 2013, there were 52 million um, in, uh, beneficiaries that were covered under the HI program, the hospital insurance, uh, mostly uh, inpatient care, uh, also skilled nursing, some ho home health and hospice. Um, in the Supplementary Medical Insurance, SMI, Trust Fund. Um, there's two different accounts, the Part B account where there's physician services and some outpatient services, um, labs, tests, et cetera. Um, and there's also the separate account in Part D, uh, the pres prescription drug account, which covered 39 million people. And, and back to the point we were making earlier, you know, this general landscape doesn't change all that much except you know, perhaps the exception of the introduction to Part D. 
Um, that generally, HI has been covering hospital services um, and other uh, facility services for a number of years. Uh, SMI has been covering physician and uh, other uh, you know, uh, non-facility-based uh, services for a number of years. And we'll get to a slide in a second that will just contrast how um, that really has evolved over time. But uh, being that we're going to talk about the financial status, it, it's important to recognize the difference in the, the financing between the um, two, uh, between the different accounts. Um, the HI is funded um, exclusively through um, the taxes. Um, the, the largest uh, most significant is uh, the payroll tax. That's 1.45% paid for by um, employers and employees. Um, and uh, more recently, there's been an additional tax uh, for individuals, uh, for single individuals making over 200,000, um, or uh, couples making over 250,000. Um, importantly, those amounts are not indexed, so the relative share of that additional tax uh, will become more significant over time. Um, in contrast, uh, Part B and Part D are primarily financed through um, beneficiary premiums and general revenue transfers, so amounts just coming out of the Treasury uh, from that are generally uh, funded with uh, income taxes and other taxes into, into the Treasury. So this is kind of the biggest difference um, in, in the report from one year to the next is, you know, how did the, the, the most recent experience change um, from the previously expected? And so you can see that in the 2014 report, um, this is uh, the evaluation of uh, or the expectations for 2013 uh, experience. You can see that the income was um, in HI was slightly more than expected, 2.9 billion, mostly due to additional payroll taxes. Um, but expenditures were uh, somewhat significantly lower than expected, uh, 4.3 billion lower than expected. That's primarily due to lower utilization of services pretty much across the board. Um, the, the, the largest services within HI or hospital staff has the um, an inpatient hospital, which has the most uh, significant effect here. Um, so that translates into a $7.2 billion less of a deficit than was anticipated last year. And pretty much the, uh, the, the, the balance of the trustees' uh, report projections build off of that base, that we're starting from a lower base. Um, similarly, in, in uh, SMI, looking at Part B, um, the, the fact that uh, the income is established annually for both Part B and Part D. Um, the, the income generally doesn't uh, vary all that much from, from anticipated. There's a slight variance on, on Part D, but that's more of a timing issue than anything else. Um, the, the key difference there is on the expenditure side. And again, expenditures for both Part B and Part D were lower than anticipated um, in last year's trustees report. Again, slower utilization, lower utilization growth than anticipated um, in last year's report. And so this is the um, evaluation of, uh, or a graph of where revenues are sourced. Um, for most of the history, the largest source of revenue was the tax on, uh, uh, was, uh, was on payroll taxes. Um, and certainly you could see a pretty sizable jump um, in general revenue transfers and premiums, um, in particular with the enactment of Part D. But you could see that over time, the level of payroll taxes doesn't change all that much. That 2.9% um, is not indexed. Uh, the level of you know the additional tax for high income earners uh, does contribute to that you know slightly increased uh, slope of that uh, the lowest line there, the payroll taxes. There's also uh, uh, portions of uh, OASDI benefits that are taxed that goes into the HI trust fund. Um, premiums is a large and growing share of. Uh, income into Medicare, um, but the largest and the one that grows the most is the general revenue transfers. Um, and so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that when we get to um, evaluating uh, Part B. Um, also on the top, you can see that there is um, a pretty sizable line called deficit. And that's the, the gap between um, what is scheduled to pay from HI, from you know, the Part A trust funds um, and the assets or revenue or income that will be available to pay for those. So when the trustees report that the trust fund will go will become uh, depleted in 2030, um, the fact that there are additionally scheduled benefits um, to be to be paid um, 
that difference between the two, the difference between what we have as the cost and what the income will be, um, that, that translates into this deficit. So in, before we kind of look forward, it is always helpful to look to the past to see how things, you know, how did we get to this situation? And we're getting close to the 50th anniversary of Medicare, but um, in terms of having experience, you know, 40 is probably the, the best we've got for, you know, for, for a good comparison purposes now, or at least for a few more years. But you can see how in 1973, um, you, know, you can see on the bottom, the total spending there was 10.6 billion, or 0.74% of GDP. And the spending was almost uh, three quarters of the spending was for inpatient services, pretty much HI. Um, there was a, there was a pretty good size um, of this pie in there for physician services. But pretty much, the Medicare program was a, was a hospital program. And the supplementary medical insurance was truly just supplementary. You fast forward to 1993. The pie is now $147.8 billion. It's a big pie. Um, and, and has grown to 2.15% of GDP. The share of inpatient is still very significant. Um, you know, it's still more than half. Uh, physicians still present, but you can see that there's other elements here that are becoming a larger and larger share. The program's becoming more complicated. It's providing more services, um, varied services. The, the treatment of, of health care is, is, you know, has evolved significantly from 1973 to 1993. And then fast forward to 2013, and the pie is almost unrecognizable if you compare it to 1973. Total spending is now up to 584 billion. Um, this is just for um, A and B services. No, this is it says D as well. Um, it's up to 3.48 percent of GDP. Um, you can see that that uh, gray sliver is now the single largest piece. And that's managed care. Um, now that does include you know managed care organizations do provide you know inpatient and do provide physicians, but in terms of uh, payments that are going out from Medicare. The largest uh, single expenditure is to manage care organizations. So it kind of goes back to the point I made originally, is that one of the things that um, is, is critical in terms of how the program um, is going to uh, you know, be evaluated, the financial status of the program, how it is, will be evaluated in the future, really depends on what the program is. And the fact that the program has changed you know, so significantly over the years, and even so significantly over the you know, fairly recent past, um, it, it does make evaluating the long-term financial effects you know, that much more challenging. The, what has been fairly stable has been the relative increase in cost in, in healthcare, and that's been you know, pretty much the most predictable aspect of, of things. Um, there's been some recent slowdowns here that's, that's followed a, a period of, you know, uh, of high cost growth. Uh, which followed a period of slower cost growth, and you know there's generally been cycles in in, in healthcare expenditures. But the important part is is that when the trustees or anyone or CBO or anyone's looking at making projections, um, it, it really is looking at a snapshot at a point in time of what the program looks like today and making you know educated guesses as to how the costs of those services would change over time, given the the, the the parameters around which the program is currently con constructed. Now, you did mention that for the 2014 report, the um, trustees opted to highlight the projected baseline or an SGR alternative. Um, I'll, I'll characterize it a little bit differently than, than Joe did at the, the onset of, the, uh, of the, this discussion. Um, in the 2013 report, the trustees presented um, three different alternatives in the, in the report. Um, there was um, the current law projections. There was an alternative to current law that uh, assumed an override of the SGR. And there was an illustrative alternative that also, um, in addition to assuming an override to the SGR, also um, presented what the impact would be if uh, some of the productivity offsets uh, would not be sustainable or would not be implemented, I should say. Um, so those three uh, basis for projections were in the report last year. Um, if you look in the report this year, there's still three bases for projections, and it's the same three. Um, the difference between last year and this year is that the highlighted projections, the ones that are emphasized throughout the majority of the text of the report, um, in last year and prior reports was the current law, 
faces. Um, and almost any time a Part B uh, figure was cited, it was almost immediately followed with something to the effect of um, this really won't happen, or this is unlikely to happen, or um, this amount is unrealistic, or, or something to that effect. And so the, the, the trustee's rationale for shifting the focus was um, rather than presenting and highlighting information that pretty much was widely established would not happen, um, still present that information, but also present information that is more useful. Um, and, and really that serves as the basis for why the shift was made this year was to to actually make the material that's presented in the reports more useful for the reader. And so rather than um, every time a Part B figure is cited in this year's uh, trustees report, it's not followed by this projection is unreasonable or it will not happen or um, you know, this, uh, this will not occur. Um, there's a, a reference to this is in current law. Um, so there, there might be a little less of those, but um, effectively that's, that was the transition that was made. Um, so mentioned the, the changes of the program uh, over time, and, and obviously one of the most significant has been the prevalence of uh, private plans, um, now known as Medicare Advantage plans, in the program. And there have been times of ebbs and flows, and we're, we're clearly in a period um, where managed care enrollment um, has been increasing and have been increasing pretty, pretty steadily. Um, you can see that even uh, though the Affordable Care Act implemented uh, in passed in 2010, had some had a freeze for Medicare Advantage payments in 2011, and um, had some reductions starting um, in 2012 and thereafter, um, we have continued to see a continued increase in the number of Medicare Advantage um, enrollees. And so clearly, looking to the future of the Medicare program, um, it's clear that Medicare, you know, private plans is going to play an important part um, in that future. So we'll turn a little bit to evaluating the formal status of the trust funds. Um, given the very different financing, uh, it's important to look at HI separately from SMI. Um, and HI basically trying to answer the question, uh, are the assets uh, plus projected income adequate to fund anticipated benefit costs? Uh, spoiler alert, no. Um, in SMI, uh, <laughs> since both Part B and Part D account uh, financing is set annually, they're uh, almost essentially in financial balance each year, um, provided that there's not any significant adverse event um, in Part B. So there's generally no long-term solvency issues, but doesn't mean there's not um, a, a, a financial uh, Im impact that's not important and not uh, worth considering. It, they, these programs do present a large and growing strain on the federal budget, so we'll look at that as well. So we'll start with some good news. Um, that this is the current projection of the short range for, um, for HI. And you can see for the next several years that in, uh, starting in, in 2015, um, income is projected to exceed um, expenditures, uh, which you know, has happened in, in, in periods in the past. Um, but, but clearly this is good news. We're gonna be building up a modest amount of assets over this time period. Um, and this is uh, certainly an improvement over last year's financial status. We'll make some comparisons to last year in, in a moment. Um, so that was the good news. Um, the shape of the um, HI fund ratio might have gotten pushed out a little bit, but this shape has not changed all that significantly from prior years. So there has been a change. The depletion date was moved from 2026 to 2030, um, but it's hard to look at this chart and say that that's wonderful news. It's clearly better news than we had last year, um, but there's still clearly a problem with HI uh, financing. So we'll go back to some good news. Um, in last year's reports, uh, the actuarial deficit, uh, the actuarial balance, which is defined to be the difference between the income rate, the, um, uh, the amount of income over uh, taxable payroll, uh, the present value of that uh, compared to the present value of uh, a cost rate expenditures over taxable payroll um, has pretty signif uh, significantly improved. Um, in last year's report, uh, the, the actual balance was minus 1.11 percent, and in the 2014 report, it's down to minus 0.87 percent. You can see that's almost exclusively based on a reduction on the cost rate. Um, the difference between last year's and this year's cost rate 
starts with the foundation of the 2013 experience being better than expected. But there was also, uh, the trustees recognized that um, that recent experience, that recent slowdown, uh, particularly in patient uh, hospitalizations, um, has occurred for several years now. Um, and so they lowered their you know, very near-term um, ex expectations for um, increases in hospital utilization, um, some case mix of different services, and some, uh, some different projection factors were, were lowered, given that there was a, a number of years of history of this uh, slower experience. And so that has translated into an improvement in the cost rate and an improvement in the actuarial balance. Um, so roughly speaking, you could say that this actuarial balance is minus 0.87% if added approximately um, to the current taxable, uh, to, tax, uh, to, to the current uh, payroll tax of 2.9%. Um, so if that was, if the current payroll tax was increased by roughly 0.87%, um, that would uh, get the 75 years uh, Medicare fund in balance. I haven't seen that proposal recently. And so here's the walkthrough of what that change is, the minus 1.1% to the minus 0.87%. Um, the most significant of the, the two leading to that improvement um, are B and D and E, which are, are closely related. The B is that if they, the baseline experience, the 2013 experience was better than expected. Um, so that improved the deficit by the 0.11%. And um, hospital-specific assumptions and other provider assumptions um, improved the deficit by 0.11 and 0.07 percent, respectively. Um, going in the other direction, there's uh, private health plan assumptions. Um, actually, uh, slightly worsened the the actuarial deficit slightly, and the issue there is that um, the program has been very, very successful, and it tends to cost Medicare slightly more to cover um, a Medicare beneficiary in Medicare Advantage than in traditional fee-for-service. The fact that there has been more and there continues to be an expectation for more uh, beneficiaries in Medicare Advantage um, has that slightly um, upward pressure on this actuarial deficit. So here's most of that in a in pictorial form. Um, you can see how there, uh, the, um, you know, the, 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 the cost rate on the top is basically the projected level of expenditures. This is as a as a share of taxable payroll. Um, the income rate on the bottom is where the, is the amount of income coming in to the trust fund. Um, you can see that through 2030, the, um, the amount of payable benefits um, is, is equal to the cost rate. We're able to pay all of the benefits through 2030. And then at 2030, there's that drop in that line so that the amount that can be paid is um, you know, pretty much just matches the income rate over time. And so it's important to note that in 2030, when the trust fund um, is depleted, uh, that doesn't mean no benefits get paid. Um, in fact, there would be sufficient assets um, or income and assets to, be, to pay 85% uh, of benefits um, at that time. And even in 2088, after a number of years of uh, 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 where there are effectively no uh, assets in the trust fund, the amount of income is expected to be 77% of what expenditures would be. But that together makes up, you know, the difference between that cost rate and the, the income rate, it makes up that actuarial deficit. So this is comparing those two lines from last year's report to this year's report. Um, the income rate pretty much doesn't change as was uh, shown on that uh, table I had earlier. Um, but the cost rate is clearly improved. And the fact that uh, most of those improvements in the cost rate were in the near term, that the, the longer term uh, trend rates weren't, uh, weren't, effect, weren't uh, changed from last year's report. So, so once you get that gap, the gap pretty much follows uh, throughout the balance of the projection. There's also, as I mentioned earlier, the illustrative alternative scenario which says, uh, which uh, provides an illustration of what the uh, cost rate would look like if some of the uh, Affordable Care Act provisions that uh, Joe referenced um, in, in his uh, introduction uh, were not to be uh, sustainable, that were not able to be implemented. Effectively, um, 
hospital services and many other uh, services, non-physician services, um, are expected to be updated. The payment rates are going to be updated by economy-wide multi-factor productivity. And the, the, the reference that Joe uh, cited earlier was that that's anticipated to be 1.1% over the long run. However, it, over the recent past and the, the measured past, uh, healthcare providers have only been able to achieve 0.4% of healthcare productivity, uh, of uh, productivity. 0.7% um, doesn't sound like a lot until you start adding them up over 75 years. And this chart illustrates that that gap um, to the extent that uh, if providers are unable to uh, achieve that level of productivity, um, the cost rate would be significantly higher and the deficit, uh, the actuarial deficit would move accordingly. Um, there's a lot less interesting charts on uh, SMI. Uh, the Part B income and outgo is only modestly changed. It is improved from last year, but, um, but uh, more modestly so than the HI. And similarly on Part D, uh, there was a modest improvement as well. On SMI, the more interesting charts look at how these programs uh, will uh, change over the future. Really, it's easier to focus on that top line. Um, and if you see the, the history going back to 2000, uh, the SMI expenditures were under 1% of GDP. And then in 2006, the Part D benefit came on, and there was a pretty good spike there. And right now, we're you know, just under 2% of GDP. But if you map this out over time, um, the influx of the baby boom population uh, is clearly evident here by having that uh, sharp increase in, in costs over the next uh, you know, 15, 20 years. And then that trend levels out. But at the end of the projection period, we're at you know, well over 4% of GDP. And that's funded, as, as noted earlier, that's funded through either uh, general revenue or through uh, beneficiary premiums. So it puts a strain both on beneficiaries um, and it also puts a strain on federal budgets. And this is a, a way to kind of just uh, demonstrate that uh, it's a little easier to, to see what the, the changes were. You know, 2013 was slightly improved both in Part B and Part D uh, from relative to the 2013 report. And the longer range uh, projections are also uh, modest, modestly improved as well. And this was, this is comparing the, uh, importantly on the Part B in terms of the 2085, uh, the uh, projected baseline scenario in the 2014, the one that assumes an SGR override, uh, to the SGR um, alternative in the 2013 report. So it's comparing uh, similar projections. So this is what happens when you put it all together. Um, as a percent of GDP, we're currently at 3.5%. Um, depending on the different scenarios that you might be projecting out, um, current law is at the end of the 75-year projection is ex expected to be 6.3% of GDP. The projected baseline with assuming just the SGR override is up to 6.9%. Um, and if you were to uh, consider the illustrative alternative, um, where the productivity cuts are phased out after uh, 2019, um, then the percent of GDP would be up to 8.4% at the end of the projection period. So another way to look at this is just how uh, our Medicare, how is Medicare spending changing relative to NAG? And um, you can see that over time, national health expenditures, um, you know, over time there's been a, a pretty good relationship between how uh, Medicare cost growth ha has been increasing and in how um, the, the nation has been spending for health care over time. Uh, one thing that's you know, kind of uh, stands out to me in this chart is that you can see that even though there's an influx of baby boomers coming in, um, that Medicare line is not steeped all that high. That, that, that there's not a, a large slope there and certainly um, seems to be perhaps even slower than the, the NHE. Um, the NHE has the um, increases in uh, coverage expansion through the Affordable Care Act, kind of pushing that up. Um, and there's also a number of uh, uh, 
policies that are constraining the Medicare um, cost increases over over that time as well. So they're they're kind of you know pushing and pulling in, in different directions at the same time. And this is a, a, another way to, to see that you know Medicare spending generally tracks um, national health expenditure spending over time. Um, you can see that there's times where the red line uh, national health expenditures is going to be you know lower than Medicare expenditure growth, and those are precede typically times where there's uh, you know constraints put in the Medicare program, and then they tend to rend their course, and the NH you know the national health expenditure line might uh, go a little bit higher for a period of time, and uh, you know the policy cycle tends to to kind of follow through. But but I think what's clear from this chart is that you know, Medicare and the entire health economy move in the same direction. Um, they are you know, the, 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 the forces underlying both of them are, are pretty consistent, um, certainly over the longer term. And yeah, occasionally you have a, a spike in Medicare cost growth when you implement a new prescription drug program in 2006, and that causes a, a pretty significant spike there. This is my last slide, and just kind of put in context, um, you know, Medicare spending and um, throw Medicaid spending in, in here as well, and just this is looking at the entire federal budget, and Keith is probably better to speak to this slide than I am, but uh, I'll, just going back to the 1970s, you could see that, you know, the, the lowest two points on, in the federal budget that I've, I kind of pulled out here are, are the Medicaid and, and Medicare line items, that, that dotted line on the bottom is Medicaid, the, um, the black line above that is, is Medicare. Um, see, the Medicare line has clearly been increasing uh, over time. Um, Medicaid line has, you know, had some you know, periods of pretty significant growth and then flattens out and then significant growth again. Um, but those things are generally increasing. And, and also look in the, in the middle of the slide where Social Security and Social Security is also going to have a, a larger share of um, you know, outlays um, over time. And the one thing that is, is most notable in here, at least to me on, on the, the dropping side, is, is the national d defense expend uh, spending or outlays. Um, and in the most recent budget, this is the 2015 uh, president's budget, um, there's a precipitous decline in defense spending um, included there. And, and that's, without that drop, um, the all other spending wouldn't be able to be maintained at those levels, given that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are, 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 are you know, that those spendings are, are pretty much on the same trajectory, uh, on, on the current trajectory. Um, so this only looks out till 2019 um, to, to kind of extend out uh, this point, uh, th this graph into the future for Medicare and, um, you know, as the baby boom population, Medicare is going to be a, become a growing share. As that baby boom population ages, um, you know, Medicaid is going to become an even growing share, um, you know, perhaps a little bit later. Social Security is just going to be going up. And the question is, is, you know, can the, you know, can, can the federal budget um, continue to pay for these, um, these benefits at these levels or at these anticipated levels? That, that's certainly a question for a, a different audience, and I think this audience would be perfectly comfortable talking about that. So with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and, and, and let Joe pass it along. Uh, th uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I would just point out that that last slide uh, uh, for, the, for the future is the, uh, you said this, but I want to emphasize that it's, it's the President's budget. It's uh, not necessarily what's, what's going to happen. Uh, Congress might, might get its act together and decide on something someday. Uh, with that, uh, Paul Ginsburg, uh, take it away, please. Thanks, Joe. Um, you know, first I want to commend Paul Spitalnik, Spitalnik on a very informative and insightful presentation and, and the report itself uh, really has a lot of uh, useful content in it. I'm going to focus my remarks on two topics. One is on the challenges in forecasting spending when recent experience is a striking departure from past trends and also not very well understood. <clears throat> Second topic is going to be the 
legislative trends of incorporating numerical cost containment requirements that are unlikely to be achievable, something that gets a lot of attention in the trustees' reports. <clears throat> so let me first speak about the baseline projection. Um, the explanation of why Medicare spending has been so slow, or the trend has been so slow in recent years, is it remains elusive. There's a pretty vigorous debate that's gone on, and I've been part of many of these discussions on the causes, oh, thanks, yeah, causes of the slowdown in total health spending. Clearly, the recession is an important factor. Uh, of course, it's inherently temporary, but the speed of recovery going forward from this point is very uncertain. Uh, most believe that other factors have been significant as well, uh, but some of these might have been influenced by the recession. It's just not clear. Now, the explanation for slowing, the slowing in Medicare trends faces much more uncertainty. I mean, for one, we know the trends in joblessness and in higher patient cost sharing have little direct impact on Medicare. Yes, there certainly are spillovers that are possible into Medicare, but even the direction of those spillovers is not clear, let alone the magnitude. So what are the implications of this uncertainty? Well, for one thing, uh, very scant comforts from the increase in projection, projected exhaustion uh, by four years from 2026 to 2030. Um, that is a large change based on one year of data. But of course, future data could move it in either direction. And as I saw in the trustees report, it's the small balance in the trust funds that makes the exhaustion, exhaustion year so sensitive to what the spending trend is. Next topic is achievability of legislative cost containment. And you know, some of the, we've been learning lessons from the SGR um, initiative for a long time. And I think some of the key lessons are not to depend on formulas that don't have incentives or pathways for productive responses. This is where the SGR really fails. But also, a broader lesson is to be realistic about how much can be accomplished, even with sound formulas. I very much applaud the trustees for making a more realistic SGR assumption and putting it into their baseline. And the consistent behavior of Congress from 2003 to 2014 is a very solid basis for that. Uh, they could have come to this conclusion a lot earlier, but I'm glad that they're here now and. Uh, We'll learn from it. I'm also pleased that the trustees' report has highlighted the multi-factor productivity adjustment as being perhaps another SGR-like. Uh, here, you know, the, uh, the potential incentives to conform to this are clear, and they are solid. Uh, but again, it's mainly how aggressive the target was. Uh, now, I think the viability of this adjustment being sustainable is going to be dependent a lot on transformation of the approach by Medicare and other payers to provider payments. So in a sense, uh, yes, we need something transformational. Uh, and I think that the best opportunity to have that transformational change to actually achieve something over many years, uh, as is called for in the Affordable Care Act, uh, is uh, a real transformation in payments. Um, the operation of the IPAB is clearly not the answer, because the entity's scope of authority is limited to payment rate cuts. And that's really what this skepticism is all about. I believe there's been a very promising start in Medicare and in the private sector on payment reform. I'm impressed with the amount of contracting activity in the Medicare Shared Savings Program, uh, the ACO program, and a number of the programs that have come out of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Clearly, there's evidence of strong provider interest in these innovations in payment. 
and there is substantial activity in the private sector and in Medicaid programs that's consistent with the Medicare directions. But what's on the table, what's out there now is not going to be sufficient to get this transformational change. Uh, and important changes in these programs is going to be needed to progress. You know, for one thing, this has to get to scale and has to generate substantial savings, uh, you know, neither of which are clear at this point. I believe that we're ready right now, not in a few years when we see more evaluations, but right now to pursue a second generation of Medicare payment reform initiatives. Uh, and here are some of the points that I believe we need in a second generation of payment initiatives. One is we need to move beyond volunteers. We need to create incentives for providers to want to participate. And having incentives to participate, going beyond volunteers, is really critical if we we're going to proceed to be able to reward good performance as well as reward improved performance. And I think to reward good performance as well as improved performance, we're going to have to blend the community uh, spending experience with the provider specific assist experience when we set benchmarks. Otherwise, the business model is just not going to be compelling for most providers. My sense is that providers are engaged today because they see the potential that reform is going to be important in the future, and they want to put their toe in the water. They want to start their transformation. But isn't this an attractive business proposition beyond that? Not at this point. Another thing that has to be done is engaging beneficiaries. Beneficiaries, of course, have a role to play if we're talking about improvements in care coordination and in managing chronic diseases. I think beneficiaries need to have incentives to choose the providers that are in the ACO or are closely related to the ACO. Uh, significant need for changes in attribution of beneficiaries to ACOs and to medical homes, uh, if, if we have appropriate models for that. Uh, today's ACO method really doesn't cut it. Um, I would like to see experimentation with additional medical home models, particularly including one that involves upside only global risk for primary care physicians, which we've seen some examples of in the private sector. Um, I'd like to, uh, and I think we're going to be forced to, develop more opportunities for specialists to be involved in payment reform. And this is going to require some changes in the ACO model, which as it stands really has few incentives for ACOs to get too much beyond primary care physicians in identifying which physician should be part of the organization. I also think we need a additional bundled payment mechanisms, initiatives that cover a much wider range of episodes of care, uh, some of which are focused on different specialties than the ones that we have out there now, which seem to be mostly focused on cardiovascular surgeons and orthopedists. Uh, I think we need to revamp the quality measurement uh, in ACO contracting. Uh, we don't have the right measures now. We need to shift the focus away from process measures and towards outcome measures. And there needs to be coordination between Medicare and private payers on measures where the reporting is going to be expensive for the providers. I want to say a few things about the tri-committee bill that uh, almost made it uh, earlier this year to do a permanent fix of SGR. I think this bill is very encouraging to the prospects for advancing provider payment reform. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, uh, this bill created an alternative approach to fee-for-service that included value incentives and also a track that is for alternative payment mechanisms, which the law defined as something where physicians are placed at risk. 
uh, the law also offered a higher payment for participants in the alternative payment mechanisms. Uh, and CMMI has already been pursuing activities, I think prompted by this developing legislation, to develop additional bundled care uh, models. The bipartisan consensus that we saw uh, for the tri-committee bill indicates support for the notion of payment reforms for physicians and presumably other providers as well. So a few concluding thoughts do that. Uh, taming the rapidly rising spending has usually been the focus in maintaining solvency of the HI trust fund. It's good to finally see some progress in recent years that, uh, that have come from the much slower rate of growth of spending. Uh, but some comes from legislative specifications that are not necessarily sustainable. And I believe that if they're going to be sustainable, the only way is to reform provider payments uh, to actually achieve those year after year productivity gains way beyond the experience of the healthcare sector. But, of course, the demographic issues in Medicare, as in Social Security, loom large as well. And in, since we are very, very far from a long-term resolution in Medicare financing. Thank you. Well, I guess that was upbeat. <laughs> Keith. Uh, I don't know how to follow that, Joe. <laughs> um, I have to say first, um, having I spent many, many years as a client of Paul's and his organization, and so I have a, a kind of an intimate understanding of what goes into it. I cannot tell you how much work is involved in producing a report like this, um, and it's not one year at a time. It is a continual, ongoing workload, and it's all-consuming. And I can't tell you how much help it is to the process. Paul and uh, his organization's projections underlie the President's budget. They underlie consideration of legislation. They underlie all kinds of things. Um, they're, they're an extraordinary group of people, highly professional, highly competent, and they exist in what is a very, um, uh, very difficult environment sometimes, and they do a terrific job. So my hat's off to you. Um, uh, I will say I now understand why Joe has trouble getting you know people to sign up for this panel. It's because when you realize you actually get the joy of reading the actuary's report in about six hours in the afternoon, it's uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so I'll think about next year, Joe. At any rate, so the first thing that jumps out when you do read this, and uh, Paul touched on this, so I can just say Paul, and it will cover everything to my right here. Um, is a startling decline, decline in costs in the last couple of years. And in Medicare, as this Paul pointed out, we don't really quite know what's going on. It seems to be somewhat unrelated to the economy, although it ties to the economy in the long run. It's hard to tie the change in people's incomes to what's happened in Medicare. That gives me a little bit more hope, and I think what you'll hear is a, it's a few degrees of optimism. Um, but to give you some sort of perspective, this decline in, in spending, you can sort of see it in the chart there. This is the average per beneficiary cost since the inception of the program. I mean, it's a pretty whopping one. What's harder to see from the chart, and I really need to, to go back and adjust it for next year, um, is that the post period, the projection period going beyond uh, 2014, is really only a growth rate of what's about 3 to 4 percent a year was my rough guess on the average per beneficiary cost, substantially down from where it is before. So what happens is each year when you're taking these progressions as a jumping off point, you do your best to sort of estimate what's going on. Um, but that's still a remarkable change in Medicare spending and uh, a very salutary one. So the question is, how much will endure? And my crystal ball is no better than anyone else's. But at least for the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, I think the way I read these projections is that they give us a little bit of a breathing room. Now, that's good and bad. It's good if we take advantage of it to do the things that Paul described, to move aggressively to try and keep pressure on health reform. It's bad if we take it as time to just relax. Uh, that's also what underlies the, the enormous improvement we've seen in the federal deficits. Uh, much of this is the decline in health care costs uh, behind it. Um, and I think Paul's report sort of teases out uh, a lot of those issues. That's the short run. 
projecting, my second point is that projecting health care costs, you know, even a few years in the, in, in the future is, is an enormously complicated undertaking. Trying to project it out 75 years is a daunting task. And what happens there, the way I think about long-run projections, is what the trustees do is they create an intellectual framework that lets us understand and helps educate us about all the dynamics of the program and the things that are going on. I suspect if I asked Paul, you know, his projection for, you know, the year 2083, he'd say it's got an uncertainty about that big around it in a real sense. Um, but what it does tell us is it tells us the dynamics. And I think Paul's charts there show us, A, how good, how well off we can be if we actually do the things this Paul has indicated need to be done, and that is to keep the pressure on the delivery system reforms and to make sure that people can live with the budgeted amount of resources going to Medicare. Uh, and secondly, his charts that show the change in the baseline, if you don't do that, tell us the risk if people actually move and slide backwards. And I think that's the way I would think about the long term. I think it's there's a lot of precision that gets introduced when you say 0.87% of payroll, et cetera, et cetera. But the central point is that even if everything goes well, we still have an issue behind it, not one that requires precipitous action tomorrow, but one that requires that we develop the new technologies to move away from the fee-for-service payment system into a world more like this Paul has described. Um, so the trustees do, in my mind, a terrific job of pointing out the risks and uh, and that this scenario should really challenge us just not to rest on our laurels. I think that's not the message to take away from this report. My third point, you know, is that if you look at the first 20 years of the projection, I think you do see this breathing room in this positive news. And again, all projections uncertain, but I'd say the first 20 are probably a little more secure than the last 20. So. Um, the phrase breathing room I use because if you look at any one of these scenarios over the first 10 to 20 years, they're not that far apart. And second, if you look back at what happened in say 2009 and where the Medicare actuaries at that point thought we were headed, I think the end of that first 20 year period uh, had Medicare as something like, uh, don't hold me to the exact numbers, 7.2, 7.5% of GDP, something very large. Now it's in the range, projected to be in the range of 5.3, 5.4% of the GDP. So that's about a 1.8%, 1.9% decline from 2009. That's a lot of money. I don't know what GDP would be in 2035. Doug, you have an estimate? Big. Big, right? So 1.85% of that is big, right? Um, and so that's a budgetary effect that's uh, salutary, and if we can capitalize on that in the short term, I think we'll be in a much better place in the, in the long term. Um, but again, the notion is, as Paul was describing, it's getting away from the fee-for-service payment system and moving towards something that uh, incents greater efficiencies. Uh, and um, I think our baseline projections in the out year should help motivate us to do that. My fourth point is that uh, there's this, this notion of the inclusion of SGR in the projections is a notable change. And in this world, that's a fairly significant step, and I commend them for, for doing that. Traditionally, the only non-current law assumption that the actuaries used was that benefits would continue even if uh, funding was inadequate. And the, the notion there was to show people what the real impact on the beneficiaries of the program needed to, would be if uh, financing was not adequate, and the amount of financing that would be needed to maintain the current benefits. And so um, it's just, I can't think of anything in history quite like SGR, where um, you know, over time things have just uh, deteriorated in a way that, um, you know, who would have guessed that a dozen years later we'd still be kicking this can down the road, but we are. Now the trustees use a very conservative methodology to estimate the future forecasts. And Joe and I were talking about this beforehand, and Joe noted that, um, you know, assuming only a 0.6% increase per year in physician fees is kind of a conservative assumption. It's not unlike the productivity adjustment uh, issue. And, and my comment back to Joe was that they do only do 0.6% there, but they were not able to, to 
take into account the fact that every year since at least 2008, the Congress has chosen to pay for these uh, extensions of the physician reform system, physician payment system, partly out of Medicare, partly out of other programs. And I think that was a reasonable assumption on their part. So all in all, I think as a forecasting exercise, this is logical. It makes the story more complex. And again, I tell you, the thing to take away is not just the numbers, take away the dynamics, take away, um, take away the importance of sort of what's going on. What we need to do is get away from this, um, uh, our problems in the SGR system with some kind of permanent reform along the lines that Paul discussed. Um, the bipartisan committee bill this year was truly a remarkable achievement, got further than we had ever guessed, and it does do what I believe is what needs to be done and signals profoundly to the world and to Medicare providers that we are wanting to move away from fee-for-service as a payment system towards something else. Our problem is that something else is not fully developed yet. We have some promising uh, private sector initiatives. We have promising initiatives in the Medicare space. Um, but we need to keep that pressure up and, uh, and use the time, uh, what the saying is, uh, time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. Um, and my fifth point, again, I'm going to echo what, uh, what, what both Paul said here, is that the HI exhaustion date moving out a few years is good news, but don't take that as the be all and end all or as the signal that everything is fine and we don't have work to do. In the first instance, the Part B trust fund is more a matter of budgetary impact and does not have the same insolvency date associated with it. Excuse me, the SMI trust funds would be more technical. The Part A trust fund has defined revenues and therefore you can project an exhausted date. So the way to look at these things is much more in the uh, analysis of the dynamics and, the, um, and over the long term. Um, particularly the sustainability of the program and the ability to finance the benefits that, uh, that are there. Um, so in sum, I think I would come away and say I'm cautiously optimistic. I think the trustees got this one dead on. Um, there is there's good reason to believe that things are significantly better. The change from 2009 is really startling when you look at it. Um, but there's a lot of reason to believe we got a lot of work left to do. Even if everything goes as planned under current law, we still have work to do, and we need to do a lot of work to move Medicare reforms to make sure that we can do what is, what is projected under current law. Um, so when we get chance, we get done, I'd like to ask Paul if he could elaborate a little bit on a couple of things um, for us. One is specialty drugs and sort of the roles and what you see in that space, and the other one is um, how they compare to how you think this lines up with CBO and so forth. So I'll let Doug do his thing, and then I'd love to get in a couple questions. Uh, well, I want to thank Joe for being uh, selected for the awful panel. Um, uh, <laughs> appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, my, my role here is to quash any sense of optimism Keith may have imparted. <laughs> um, Cautious optimism. <laughs> but, but before I do that, I, I want to um, applaud Paul for an outstanding report. and just based on my experience at CBO, say a little bit about two things that are going on here that are really important. Uh, the first is the uncertainty of these long-run projections. Um, and I was at CBO when it uh, went public with its 100-year micro simulation, stochastic micro simulation model of the future of Social Security and um, was asked by a senator if it was right. And um, I said, well, <laughs> Here's the issue, sir. If we'd done this report in 1900, we would have had to anticipate the First World War, the Second World War, the Great Depression, oh yes, and the advent of Social Security itself. So um, there's, a, there's a good reason to look at this exactly as Keith has emphasized, which is what does this tell us, not about the numbers, but about the trajectory of the program and the drivers of that trajectory. Um, and, and I thought this was a, a good report from that uh, point, vantage point. The second is, just how hard it really is to depart from current law. Current law is well-defined and, and, uh, and easy to implement and uh, utterly unrealistic. Um, but again, at CBO, I came to the conclusion that the baseline had nothing to do with current policy and that we needed to better inform the public about the trajectory of, of the federal uh, budget. So we put out, for the first time, something has now become 
quite standard, which was this table of alternatives, which I called the build a better baseline uh, table. You could just go select the things you believed and put them together and figure out what it looked like. But in doing so, you have to make some choices. You have to say 0.6% is going to be the override of the SGR or whatever it might be. And in the process, um, you will tick off somebody somewhere up on Capitol Hill. And um, you know, I, I, I applaud you for doing it. Um, you don't have to name names, but hang in there. Um, I, I, because <laughs> this it's never painless to do this it is better information it's important but but it does require a lot of work to to um, get it across now uh, let me say a little bit about the issues and why um, I was thrilled to see the public trustees uh, impart a message of urgency and the need for for new legislation and, and change quickly because um, I don't believe we have any breathing room uh, I understand that if you look at this program in isolation, it might look that way, but if you look at it in the context of, of everything else that's going on, I don't see that, there, that the Medicare program is going to be given time and breathing room. Um, first and foremost, uh, it is right now contributing $290 billion to the, the federal budget deficit. That's the cash flow deficit in, in Medicare. Uh, it's been doing this for a long, long time, and it will uh, continue to do that. And as a result, it's responsible for 30% of the national debt right now, all by itself. And that is, number is going to get worse, not better. And as it gets worse, not better, the interest on that national debt will increasingly get uh, uh, become a, a, a budgetary issue. And we saw that in the line that, that uh, Paul put up in his last chart. Um, if you start thinking of Medicare and the, and the interest cost as, as the same thing, it's much more troubling much more quickly. And indeed, the, the budgetary dynamics um, uh, are, are quite um, uh, depressing once you get past about 2017, 2018. Everything really uh, looks bad from a budgetary point of view. In that same chart, we showed this sharp decline in national defense spending. We have no idea if the world is going to become a safer place that allows us that kind of room. And that's, that's a big part of a lot of the budget projections that you see that we're gonna spend a lot less on national security as a fraction of the economy than we have historically. Who knows, so that won't be there. And at the same time, you know, Social Security is also progressively getting in worse and worse financial shape. Um, you know, over the 75 year uh, horizon, everyone always talks about Medicare's problems, $9 trillion gap between what's going out and what's coming in. In the same 75 years, it's over 10 trillion for, for Social Security. So uh, the point is simply that whatever transitory gains may have been made in cost per beneficiary in Medicare, that, that is absolutely great, but the rest of the budgetary world is not cooperating to allow Medicare to say, okay, let's figure out why this happened and in five or 10 years get around to fixing these payment systems. I just don't think it's true. I think everything that Paul Ginsburg said about needing superior payment systems is absolutely on the mark. Uh, I just think it needs to happen yesterday um, and, and not uh, pretend that we have a lot more time. Uh, then I just want to close with two observations. Um, I think Keith uh, Fontenot identified SGR as uniquely awful in some special way. It may be the worst policy ever created that survived to be kicked down the can 12 years in a row or something. So I, we need a little history on that. Um, and, and I also just want to point out just how low the bar has been set. Um, Keith described the tri-committee bill as a remarkable accomplishment. It's not law. So we have all been beaten by the dysfunction in this town. It's time to actually pass laws, fix the program, and not celebrate committees not um, doing their job. <laughs> well, from cautious optimism to, <laughs> to enthusiastic <laughs> pessimism. It's why you came. Exactly. Hey, can, I just say, can, I, can I just say there, yeah, I right. actually agree with him. We shouldn't <laughs> wait. But I do think on the payment side that we need to do it right. And so I would say the one way to think about this is you don't have to do it all in one bill. You can do a series of things. We know a lot of things now we could do to fix XGR, enact that bill, and pay for it in a reasonable way and get started at the same time we continue to develop the others. So cautious optimism, but I share his passion for getting it done. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I think on my take from the Tri Committee bill is that it really is a reflection of the perspective of uh, the Health Committee members to move in this direction. But there's sufficient dysfunction in the Congress that, uh, as Doug said, uh, we don't have a law. Right. Well, and this concept of get it right, interesting. 
interesting theory. We've been getting it right for 50 years now. Uh, I mean, the, the fact is that there's no getting it right. You have to have a, a, a structure that is not so rigid. Unfortunately, we don't have that. But you need a structure that is not so rigid that you are locked into bad policy for a very long time. And you're locked into bad incentives, which uh, discourage the kind of changes that are not going to be made by government. They're going to be made by the providers and the private sector actors and the consumers. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Um, I think we had some questions that we wanted. We wanted to interrogate Paul Spitalnik. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I think, uh, Keith, you were the first. As I was, uh, I was getting into a little wonk mode with your supplementary tables, and I was trying to figure out how to compare the CBO numbers um, to the uh, trustees' numbers, and particularly like you and I were talking about, you couldn't get to the net offsetting receipts question, the net outlay question. How do you see your numbers lining up with CBO? Well, the fact that CBO came out three weeks earlier with the same depletion date. Um, <laughs> That, that, that's at least a one very uh, clear indication that we're looking at things in the same way. Um, and, and I think we have, uh, you, you generally look at healthcare expenditures over time and there's, you know, when you look over a, a 10 or, or, or 20 year period, it, it, it's long enough so that the year to year fluctuations tend to, um, you know, wash each, each other away and you get to more of a, of a mid range uh, expectation. Um, there is less disagreement of certainly the trajectory and, and the direction that we're heading. So did, you also mentioned on uh, specialty drugs. Um, um, and that's one thing that's uh, evident in looking at the data, um, that the Part D projections generally have been coming in lower than an anticipated. Um, and we're currently at something along the lines of 84% generic use. Um, and that's up from, it, it, in 2013 it was about 84%, in 2012 it was about 81%. Um, at some point, and that point is gonna be some point lower than 100%, um, we're not gonna be able to get those cost savings anymore. The, the cost savings for drugs shifting from uh, brand to generic or increased generic use. And at the same time, there has been this dramatic shift in generic use, there's also been um, the impact of new and very uh, expensive specialty drugs. Um, this report uh, was generally prepared with 2013 experience. And so the impact of a particular um, specialty drug that uh, hit the market very late in 2013, that there's been a significant cost uh, starting in 2014, um, didn't fully work its way through, um, it didn't directly work its way through these projections. Um, there have been, obviously, his, the historical pattern of specialty being a large and growing share of uh, Part D expenditures clearly has been um, reflected, but the experience of a particular drug, Sovaldi, um, and, and the treatment of hepatitis C has not been uh, directly reflected. Uh, just a comment uh, about uh, Paul Spitalnik's comment that uh, uh, OAC and, and CBO are looking at things uh, in a similar manner. I think that's probably true in the near term, but over the long term, it isn't true. The CBO says in their in their long term report they, that they change their their long term assumptions from all past practice, uh, and uh, they say this year uh, CBO no longer projects whether or when uh, the uh, uh, restraints that uh, Congress might place on the on the cuts in uh, update factors for uh, Part A providers for hospitals and so on. Um, I'm trying to use their language here. Uh, this year, after reassessing the uncertainty involved, CBO no longer projects whether or when these restraints might wane. Instead, for those specific cuts that uh, uh, Paul's comment uh, at the end of the, of the trustee's report, I thought, made, made quite clear, uh, is uh, unlikely to stay the way they are I and mean, just because you haven't seen Congress take action doesn't mean that it won't I think in fact the SGR experience is pretty a pretty good predictor there instead for those elements uh, there are now no differences from the extended band baseline in other words they're assuming that cuts that will continue to accelerate over 75 years will in fact be taken 
Well, that is actually included in the projected baseline. So um, th 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 there, th there's a methodological approach to how do you um, project how current law will be implemented in the, in the future, um, and then there's the assumptions underlying that. So there are, and, and that's why uh, the trustees, um, in part uh, on the recommendation of the Medicare Technical Panel, a, a panel of independent experts um, that looked at this particular um, issue, um, and, and they suggested, this Medicare technical panel, um, suggested that it would be um, beneficial uh, to the readers to illustrate um, and to demonstrate what that gap between um, those uh, uh, provider re uh, cuts uh, anticipated in the ACA versus what, it, what a trajectory would look like if those did not happen. And, and so that's why th those it's important that, that those different scenarios, those different methods are, are uh, evaluated and presented in the trustees' report. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, the question is what uh, what is a useful way to look at something? Uh, and since we can all have disagreements about what's going to happen to policy, it makes sense, uh, just as uh, Doug tried to establish at CBO, it makes sense uh, to uh, give, give some range of assumptions, which gives a range of, uh, of estimates as well. Uh, well, with that, unless uh, people have more uh, specific uh, interrogations for Paul Spitalnik, why don't we go to the audience uh, and uh, let's see here. Who's, I see a hand over here, a couple of hands here. Um, so please uh, identify yourself uh, and uh, form your statement in the form of a question. Hi, I'm Jane Galvin with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Uh, I guess this is a question for Paul. Um, so in your um, report, is sequestration assumed to be then one of the kind of cuts that you were talking about? I didn't hear the word sequestration used um, at all, and we know that the physicians and the Medicare Advantage plans, the Part D plans, the hospitals, everybody got a 2% um, cut, and that cut has been now in place for several years. So, and there doesn't seem to be any end game to it. So could you explain to me in layman's terms how that fits into um, the projections? Um, sure. Sequestration is uh, part of current law. Um, it is being currently implemented. Uh, payments to most Medicare providers, um, or to Medicare providers are being affected, being reduced by the sequestration, roughly 2% um, off of what uh, they would have been provided absent sequestration. Um, that's part of current law. There's been a number of uh, modifications to the sequestration um, provision over time, and uh, the trustees' report now reflects the current law that uh, sequestration will be implemented, uh, be applied through 2020 into 2024. Hi, Paul Heldman from Potomac Research Group. A question for um, uh, Paul from the Medicare program again um, on the the drug trend, which is clearly um, the numbers show growing faster on a per capita and aggregate basis than the rest of the program, other medical spending in the program. How much of that is due to price? How much is due to utilization? And how does that affect your thinking on, uh, or your forecast on uh, growth in hospital spending or other parts of the program? Uh, and then my other question is uh, related to um, Part A and B spending growth as a way of calculating the MA rate update. In the last couple of years, there have been um, significant revisions in uh, historic project uh, spending on A and B that have affected the MA rate update. And uh, from my layman's way of thinking, I would think that those numbers are baked in at some point. So I'm wondering what causes that and whether or not the last couple of years have been outliers or we can expect um, historic revisions to have a big impact on the MA rate update. Start with the second question first because I'll could probably spend more time talking about that one. Um, so just on on the MA updates and uh, it, certainly in the MA announcement that went out this April, uh, there were the reductions uh, for prior periods it, experience reflected in there that uh, effectively um, have to make a projection as to what cost will be in a future year. Um, to the extent that experience is different than that, um, that gets reflected in future updates. Uh, 
as mentioned throughout the most of my presentation, uh, 2013 in particular, um, experience came in lower than anticipated um, than, than last year, which therefore made our projections of, in, in, the, in the case of the April announcement, the 2015 rates, um, th those were lowered as well. So tie that together with some of the, the comments I made about how the trustees are looking forward in, in, in some of their projections. They've lowered the, the, the fact that we've gotten uh, some of the utilization, um, you know, th that the fact that utilization has slowed so precipitously um, in, in the early part of this decade um, for a number of years, uh, the trustees now anticipate that that recent trend will continue at least for the next several years, um, more so. Um, so to the extent that last year's estimate was overstated for the fact of uh, anticipating more growth in utilization than, was, than, than what actually occurred, that seems to be less likely to occur this year. Of course, the number of years of experience being better than expected doesn't have to stop now. So um, yeah, the, it, it, I would hope that uh, we are equally likely to have um, overestimated um, 2014 spending as we are to under, have underestimated. I mean, to me, that's what you know, the, the purpose of the actuarial estimate is, is to um, you know, have the best estimate. It's more like, as likely to be you know, too, high, too low as, as too high. Um, but the fact that those um, increases um, have, have been lowered since uh, prior reports seems to make that risk a little bit less. Um, turning to Part D, uh, th there have been a, a number of years where uh, the, 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 the Part D projections um, have come in lower than anticipated. It's almost every year, um, in fact. And the, the, the question becomes, you know, the, the, the shift to generics, and I, I mentioned this a, a little bit earlier, um, it, every time it goes up and it's been continuously going up, um, there's been debate as to whether or not we've kind of reached the peak. Um, you know, we had, you know, a patent cliff just come come through that you know, many significant, um, you know, widely used drugs went off patent, went generic, um, and we were expecting a pretty sizable increase in generic. That that has mostly borne out, and maybe it's borne out even more so than was anticipated. Um, at some point, 84 percent. You know, it's probably not the ceiling, but I'm sure 100% is. And and, and 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 we've been following that path pretty consistently. And and the uh, and, and the trajectory on specialty clearly um, is not going away. And in fact, it's getting stronger. And you look at the projections in this report. Um, you know, the the Part D benefit is is split into. You know, there, there's a few different payment um, aspects of the Part D benefit. There's the direct subsidy payment that is you know, pretty much the average benefit, but there's also a reinsurance component that is targeted towards those uh, that have the higher utilizers. If you look at the reinsurance costs, those go up at a much faster rate than the overall benefit. And so the, that, um, that, that dichotomy of the benefit um, is probably going to get worse over time. If I could follow that up, I noticed in your report, uh, you know, a fairly high rate of increase in spending over the next five years in Part D. And at first I thought, well, this might be, have something to do with specialty drugs. But then it occurs to me, well, it's probably the phase out of the donut hole. And offhand, would you, could you say how much of the, the pretty high number is, uh, in a sense, policies as opposed to your projections of uh, drug use patterns? Sure. The, the, the closing of the donut hole certainly does a increase costs, but um, the amount of additional costs that are being funded through the benefit there um, isn't very large. The, uh, a fair portion of the, of the closing of the donut hole was being funded through uh, manufacturer, additional manufacturer uh, contributions. Um, so that's not a major driver in, in terms of the increases. I'll get back to the comment from the, the last uh, question as well. Um, and the interaction between uh, prescription drug, you know, increases in prescription drug spending and the impact on uh, A and B services, uh, hospitalizations and physician services. And, and CBO came out with their analysis on that topic uh, not too long ago. Um, and there was, you know, they, they found that there was clearly a relationship between the two. And we're obviously going to uh, be evaluating and studying uh, that work as well. But we, the, the trustees have not built in a direct impact, um, you know, for the, 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 the wide, the, the wider availability and wider use of prescription drugs at this point. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> so, 
Hi, Andy Hartsfield with Sanofi. Uh, actually, you may have just answered the question, and that is CBO built in a fairly crude, although a welcome uh, observation that some increase in prescription drug use does have a uh, lowering impact. You mentioned uh, the generic rate, looking at savings in the drug budget based on generic use. I mean, do you see, do you want generic use to go up? Do you think you would save money in the long run if it, long run if it were a hundred percent, or do you recognize, for example, that you know at some point, <clears throat> and hopefully in our lifetime, there'll be a cure or treatment for Alzheimer's, for example, and it, it will be very expensive. But in the long run, that's what's going to save you know Alzheimer's from breaking the bank. I mean, do you try to look at that, or do you look at it? Are you forced to, and I don't mean it's a criticism because it's hard to do, but if you just look at the silo, do you just look at that silo of drug spending and say, that's bad, and you know if it keeps going up necessarily, or is there a way to uh, factor in the CBO's uh, adopted methodology? So I, I try to avoid value judgments in uh, Medicare projections. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to project what we think the costs are going to be. Um, and certainly to the extent that there are uh, new medications, and Sovaldi is a great example, that do, will clearly um, reduce uh, the number of uh, you know, pretty significant and costly um, you know, liver events in, in, in the future. Um, and so to the extent that we can measure that and, and reflect that and incorporate it in our estimates, that to me is um, what, what my obligation is, is to have the best Medicare projections that we can possibly produce. Um, and then I'll leave it to the policymakers and to the public at large to determine whether or not, um, you know, hypothetically, we'll throw out a hypothetical example of, um, you know, a, a pill that could cure uh, Alzheimer's um, that would clearly be a wonderful thing. Um, society at large will have to determine whether or not we can devote the resources to actually provide that. And so we can, we, we can do our part to estimate what that cost will be um, for the pill and what the cost savings would be for reduced treatment um, in, and uh, reduced expenditures in other, uh, other programs. Um, but it doesn't change the underlying financial pressures um, that you know, have been emphasized throughout the, the discussion today. Well, I believe the standard uh, answer to this general question is it's in there, so don't worry about it. Um, anyway, oh, there's a, there's a question there. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't see you, John. I, we, no, we have John. the monopoly here. We're trying to get a bonus oh. payment for being the accountable okay. question it, organization. Uh, apparently, anybody who actually wants to <laughs> ask a question has to sit at that table. I mean, you know. So no, no, we'll, I, get, we'll get to you next. My, my real question is about um, Medicare Advantage, uh, similar to, to this Paul's question, but um, when, when the ACCA was passed, a lot of us thought that Medicare Advantage was going to go the same way as Medicare Plus Choice in the 90s, and that's not happening. But the, th this question is really for everybody. The administration seems to have a lot of flexibility that surprises a lot of people. The last Medicare Advantage letter uh, surprised the Wall Street analysts. You know, Humana popped up by 12% on that day. Does the panel think we're going to keep getting surprised? by the Medicare Advantage letters, and I mean, how much confidence can we have in what's going on in, in Medicare Advantage? I was actually thinking about that when I was reflecting on remarks here. And when we just talk about this trend towards legislating cost savings and how dependable are they, uh, you know, I think uh, you know, broadening it into uh, executive branch authority is uh, is very appropriate that uh, it just overall uh, makes it that much more difficult to be making these projections uh, because the uh, you know the opportunities for this uncertainty this policy uncertainty to take hold uh, just keeps growing. I think I think it's going to be a big deal going forward. I mean, let, let's face it. You know, Congress is gridlocked and not um, doing anything. I don't think the, they're going to be able to handle the, the cuts in, to providers, these productivity adjustments, unless the rest of the economy continues to cooperate and have productivity collapse, which it has so far. Um, but in that kind of a world, it gets left to the, the agencies to, to handle the pressures because the, the cuts are unreasonable 
and something has to be done and the rulemaking process is, is the only way to get there. And, um, you know, in situations where that isn't satisfactory, where, you know, everything goes to the Supreme Court. It's, it's a reflection of the policy environment. Well, I, I agree with that, but I would also uh, add uh, that, of course, uh, the uh, uh, CMS has always had um, considerable latitude in interpreting whatever Congress comes up with. So it adds to the uh, pleasure that Paul Spitalnik and his staff has in doing these estimates. Uh, there's a. Um, Mark Warshawski. Um, the, the Medicare trustees report has always given both the trustees perspective as well as an overall budget perspective. And this year there was a small footnote on the Social Security side which sort of gave that same perspective. But the uh, Social Security actuary was very critical of introducing even that small footnote. Um, I was wondering perhaps the panel, I'm not going to ask the, uh, his colleague, uh, the CMS actuary, to to comment on that, but the panel, to sort of comment about the trustees' perspective versus the budget perspective and whether it's appropriate to include that in the trustees' reports, uh, both for Medicare and for Social Security. Well, I, I think I'm pretty clear. I think it's important to have the budgetary perspective because the trustees' report is about the outlook for Social Security or Medicare, and it is intended to signal the need for policy changes in those programs. And I don't believe you can ignore the larger budgetary perspective in uh, evaluating the need for policy changes. I mean, in this era, the larger budgetary perspective is going to drive everything over the next 15 years. So that you might as well show that and, and let the consumers of the report understand it. Yeah, I would add the perspective that I've always thought that the, uh, you know, the trusts are just a device to motivate policy making that pays attention to the broader budgets and uh, you know given where we are in Medicare where the exhaustion date is so far in the future uh, that's just not coming to pass so it doesn't reduce the need at all for grappling with the overall federal fiscal situation but you know there's one more tool that won't come into play for a while uh, in Medicare and in Social Security as well yeah I the I mean, the pro one of the problems is that uh, uh, numbers don't necessarily uh, motivate politicians. Uh, why is that? It's, we don't <laughs> understand this. But, but the, the reality is that uh, the trustees report, even in a bad year, in a, in a bad year, uh, gets uh, maybe a week's worth of publicity, and then everybody, go, everybody goes back around their, about their business. So r really, the issue has to do, I think, with uh, the interplay among the various um, uh, interests uh, in the health sector. And the one interest that is not well represented, of course, is the consumer and the taxpayer. I guess that's two, but they're the same people. Uh, their interests are not, are not well represented because, uh, precisely because uh, policymakers uh, in Congress um, have a hard time uh, dealing with uh, trying to find a balance between uh, higher taxes, uh, higher deficits, higher debts, uh, and um, uh, the immediacy of uh, a payment to a provider. I just want to, you know, emphasize that in because of the the sequester and you know the Budget Control Act, there are now interests driven by bu their budgetary limitations that are going to be pressuring the the Medicare program. They're called non-defense discretionary spending interest groups. There actually is a non-defense discretionary coalition. It's the worst name in history. But um, <laughs> they're out there. And the defense uh, uh, discretionary folks are out there. And, and they are, they've got very tight caps on them for a decade. And they're going to want to loosen those caps. And the only place to do is to come to the Social Security and, and Medicare to do it. And so showing that that's the future has got to be important to the policymakers. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Social Security case per se. But my sense is that over the years, Paul's predecessor, Rick Foster, was quite vocal about or quite clear about, you know, the implications beyond that. It, um, and I'm sure that, you know, I, my reading of this uh, was that it's still kind of there. Uh, it gets very complicated, you know, I mean, they, and I'll let Paul speak to this, but, you know, the actuary is responsible for the fund, 
and they develop their own sets of economics and their own sets of demographic project, their own sets of all projections, really, um, which are wholly independent from either CBO or OMB or anything else. And I think there's a utility in that. I mean, there really is. It, it sort of it gives us a, another fresh look at the world. Um, be a little, I think you could get them to maybe do a little more around or ask them to do a little more around what the implications of this are in a budgetary context or something, but in the end, to ask them to project the rest of the budget might be going a little far, um, given it's complicated enough to do for Medicare. Uh, so I don't know, Paul, Paul, could you comment a little on the different perspectives? But I'm, I'm sympathetic. I mean, I like the budget perspective. I think it's really helpful, but I expect sure. there's limitations. Uh, so it, it really, the, the foundation is that there's a difference in the, uh, in the funding of the different programs. Um, and so, you know, similar to HI, um, Social Security is funded through, um, you know, dedicated tax revenues. Um, as compared to in SMI, the funding is primarily through general revenues, which is, it, it is you know, comes straight out of the budget. Um, and so that's where the, uh, the, the reason for having the, the, the clearer link between Medicare expenditures um, and the budget is is most direct when evaluating the SMI program, um, which is uh, just a, like a, as I said, a straight draw on on general revenues, and a, a demand on general revenues. Um, the the issue becomes, you know, when you're talking about a, a buildup of assets in a trust fund, um, and then the redemption of those assets, um, and and those implications on the budget are, are very different than under the the SMI program. So that's in. In short, the the, 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 the cause of, of the, you know that friction. Uh, Joel Cooper Smith from Georgetown. I have two uh, questions or points. Uh, one is that um, you know we expect there to be a lot of expensive drugs in the future, but I think what's going to happen before that is there will be a lot of expensive biomarkers and tests to lead us to preventive care, for example, in Alzheimer's. There's a, a lot more progress now in biomarkers than there is in the drugs. So that means a lot of healthy people will be treated and you won't get the benefit of, um, uh, <coughs> of less hospitalizations and all that for many, many years down the line. So that's one thing. Secondly, um, just looking at the curve that you showed, the curves of spending for defense going down and the, everything else going up, or mostly up, um, it seems that um, we have moved as a country to a European style social state, social welfare state, you might say, without single payer medicine. I mean, all these other programs seem to be doing it. And just looking at the various interest groups, it seems to be very hard. I think it would be, it is very hard now for the defense interests to kind of get back into it and get that part up when, as you said, it's going to mean that we can't afford these other things. So I, I just wonder what people think about that. Uh, I, I don't know anything about biomarkers and won't pretend. So on the second one, uh, that's a, a far more articulate statement of, of what I was trying to, to emphasize. You know, just because it might be difficult for the defense interest to pull it off doesn't mean they won't try. The same is true for, you know, the funding in the non-defense discretionary, which is, you know, a pretty vocal group in, uh, both on the Hill and, and out there. You know, if you're an engineering college and you want uh, funding for, for research, that's going to go away. There, there are going to be some very, very pitched budget battles going forward uh, in an attempt to reshape that chart. I, I think it's inevitable. Well, I have a little historical note. Uh, it just occurred to me um, in, was it 82? Uh, when was the Social Security fixed? Does anybody remember? 83. 83. In 1983. <laughs> uh, uh, well, actually, I think it was really started in 1982. It was recognized that the Social Security Trust Fund was, was uh, going to become insolvent almost immediately. Uh, and uh, Congress uh, tried to uh, uh, you know, put a committee together, and the committee, I think, it, it, it gave up at some point. And the way I, the story I heard was that, uh, and I can't remember who it was, but uh, t t two of the principals were walking down the street, ran into each other, and they both said, we've got to do something about this. This is trouble. 
And so uh, the, what was the solution? Well, they brought some money from Medicare. Now let's move to next year, DI. We won't be moving to Medicare. We won't be able to get the money. There isn't that gigantic surplus that we had in, in 1983. Uh, so I, I think the immediacy of uh, these kinds of budget battles is, is upon us. Next year should be a very, uh, well, interesting year. So, and biomarkers, I, I, I know enough about to be dangerous, and that's about it, but it's both, uh, as I understand, it's both something you can use in drug development to help, uh, potentially help uh, understand better what pathways are working, what pathways aren't working. So you could see one effect of that is that, you know, you help uh, smooth and try to figure out how to use these in the clinical trial process which could produce more beneficial medications. And then, as you pointed out, in the, in the, in the sense of uh, whether it's genetic screening or whatever it is that tells you what drug is effective for what person, um, is that where you were going with this, or are you talking about the drug development side? Yeah, I think that's part of it, but those medicines are very expensive. Yes. Uh, you know, they're designer drugs, biologics that, that are uh, uh, very expensive. But the other part is just uh, there are uh, radiographic biomarkers. For example, for lung cancer, this has been a big discussion about, you know, looking early and then doing, doing possibly a lobectomy. So I, I think there's an awful lot of these, um, I, I don't know, for some reason we've gotten into a dip in costs because we're, I think a lot of, I think part of it. A lot of drugs have become generic. That's part of it. And we're before this era where we're we're looking at very uh, uh, more and more expensive designer drugs, such as, for example, hepatitis. And and we're we're going to look at also with that. And that's the point I would make: is biomarkers that will uh, lead people to use these drugs a lot earlier than they did before. That's what seems to be developing in Alzheimer's. It's true. We're going to get designer drugs. We're going to get better drugs based on these biomarkers. But we're also going to have biomarkers looking at people at age 50 or 45. And then there'll be a big discussion about when do you treat these people. And the treatment is going to be hugely expensive, I, I would think. I think it, there, is a, there is an issue here that maybe Paul can comment on a little bit that I remember the, uh, in my uh, reading of the 2012 uh, or 2010, 2011 technical panel. Uh, these are the technical panels that advise the trustees. And one of the things they talked about was in how you do drug projections, whether you use micro approaches, kind of as he's suggesting, or combine them with macro approaches. Any thinking on that and how, I mean, it's such a dynamic world as you point out that. Uh, well, I know that in the end, if I've got about half the people saying my estimates are too low and the other half I hear from all the time that, that say my estimates are too high, I think we're probably doing something yeah, right. So. At least, at least I'm hopeful. Actually, you know, one thing I could say is that the, uh, you know, in discussions about, you know, how long is this very low spending trend going to last, I would say that one of the biggest pieces of uncertainty is the technology side because it's recognized that, uh, you know, the effect of new technology on health spending has dramatically slowed, and nobody understands why. And we really don't know whether this is just a cyclical thing that we've had before that we haven't understood, and that there's a, a new wave of things coming out that will be very expensive to use. Um, and I think we just, I think the key thing is that, uh, you know, we, we can't take much comfort in uh, the projections based on the slow trend because we know that there are some real risks of, uh, of the trend speeding up and, uh, you know, and, and we may be seeing the first, you know, with Savaldi and with some other drugs, we may be seeing, you know, the leading edge of a particularly challenging new wave of technology that's going to be very expensive. Okay. Well, I don't see uh, other questions, so uh, please join me in thanking the panel for a really interesting discussion. <laughs> <laughs>